Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. William Thompson, and as I said, I'm one of the pain specialists here at the Core Institute. I primarily see patients out of the Scottsdale and the Mesa offices. And I'm really appreciative for your time today to go over what is the most common reason that a patient seeks the care of a physician, that is low back pain. I have no real financial disclosures. I'm not talking about any devices tonight. Um, our objectives are to try and go over the various structures in your body that can cause low back pain. And I want to clarify some of the really frequently confused terminology when it comes to low back pain and go over some of the history, examination, and imaging findings that we're going to see in patients with chronic low back pain. And finally, as we go through this, we're going to talk about some of the commonly used interventional treatments to try and treat uh, all these painful conditions. So why is back pain an important topic? Why are so many of you here listening to this talk tonight? Well, as I said at the beginning, it is the most common or one of the most common reasons a patient will seek the care of a physician. It's also one of the most common reasons that people miss work. And the prognosis for those who become disabled from back pain can be quite poor. Um, one study looked at patients who were disabled from back pain and found that after six months of being disabled from work, their odds of returning to work full time went down to about 50%. And as you can see on the slide, after one year, that number dropped to 20%. And after two years being disabled by back pain, that number dropped to less than 3%. So it really highlights the importance of trying to treat low back pain as effectively and efficiently as we can to try and get people back to their lives. Not surprisingly, giving it such a common reason for patients to seek the care of a physician, the cost of the care of low back pain is, is a major factor in the healthcare system. Um, we looked at a study here in the spine, um, which showed that there was an increase in cost of about 65% between 1997 and 2005. And in 2005, we spent around $86 billion on the treatment of back and neck problems. This has only continued with time, and as of 2016, the cost is closer to $134.5 billion. This slide highlights some of the expenditures for common conditions, the most uh, highly cost, uh, costly conditions that we treat in the healthcare system. On the top left here, you see back and neck pain, and then here you see musculoskeletal disorders. That would include your joint pain and other um, common orthopedic problems. So we're right up there with diabetes, falls, and other common conditions that cost a lot to the healthcare system. But this really isn't about cost, this just highlights how frequently patients need this care and the importance to get it um, directed to those who need it. So who's at risk for back pain? Well, men and women actually overall have a very similar risk. Women tend to have an onset a little bit later in their life, statistically speaking. We see higher risk in certain people. Obesity is clearly associated with a higher risk. Smoking is associated with a higher risk of back pain and most all chronic pain conditions. And in fact, there are certain surgeries that are more likely to fail in people who continue to smoke, highlighting the importance of quitting smoking, not just for the risks of cancer and lung disease, but also for the risks of pain. Poor physical fitness certainly contributes, unfortunately, in American society. We often find ourselves sitting in front of screens and not actively engaging our core muscles as much as we should, and that can predispose us to developing back pain. Certain occupations, um, in particular those with repetitive bending and twisting, um, sitting for prolonged periods such as long-haul truck driving, pilots, et cetera, can also put you in increased risk for having low back pain. And job dissatisfaction actually uh, correlates as well. So where does the pain come from? Well, this can be a really challenging question um, because referral patterns of pain often overlap and are nonspecific. What that means is that there are a variety of structures in your low back that can cause you to feel pain in similar areas. And so what the pain medicine specialist's goal to do is to evaluate you and try and figure out which of those structures, which of those causes is responsible for your pain. I like to keep things simple, so I'm going to try and break it up into four basic categories. Bones and joints, discs, spaces, and muscles. And we'll kind of take those together in turn. So first is bones. 
Um, what you see here is a depiction of the skeleton. And in red, you see the lumbar vertebrae. Lumbar means low back. So when we're talking about our low back, these are the areas that we're talking about. There are five vertebrae in the low back in, almost, in most people. There's L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. And these bones all connect down with the sacrum, right here at the bottom, which then connects with the pelvis. So when we look at bones, if you've ever had an x-ray or an MRI and you've looked at your report, there are going to be some really confusing terms on there. These terms here are so confusing that many physicians that don't specialize in spine often get them confused. So I think it's helpful to have a basic understanding of what these terms mean in case you're ever looking at your own MRI scan or reading a report, for instance. So spondylosis is one of the more common diagnoses that I give a patient, and that's a relatively nonspecific term, but it's used to refer to degenerative changes in the back, in particular in the facet joints. Spondylolysis is a is a condition where patients often have a deficit in part of their bones right here, often from an injury in childhood. And then spondylolisthesis is otherwise known as a slippage of one vertebrae relative to the other. So what I have here on the side is an x-ray and we're looking from the side. And if you look at the vertebral bodies or the bones and you follow this line down, it's a pretty straight line showing that they're pretty well aligned in the front and in the back until you get here to the bottom. So you can see this fine line is now separated by a gap. Similarly on the back here, this fine line goes down straight and then there's a big separation here. So what you see here is this L5 vertebra has slipped forward on the sacrum and this is called a spondylolisthesis. This condition can cause a variety of different pain symptoms as we'll see because it can lead to compression of the nerves that go down your legs and it can also lead to arthritic pain. So looking at the bones, compression fractures is a fairly common source of back pain in particular in the older population but it can occur in young patients as well. The most common cause is osteoporosis which really means decreased bone density. So in patients with osteoporosis their bones just aren't as strong as they used to be and what can happen is, is that the vertebral bodies or the bones in your back can actually collapse down upon themselves. In this x-ray you see here I'm highlighting a relatively normal vertebral body. You see it looks like a rectangle, very crisp lines and then when you go one level below you can see that this the vertebral body is kind of compressed and collapsed upon itself. It is shrunk down and that's what a compression fracture is. And in this case, this patient had an osteoporosis related compression fracture. Trauma can cause these fractures as well, even in young patients, um, in particular a fall from a, from a pretty good height. Even mild trauma can cause a compression fracture in someone with osteoporosis, again because the bones just aren't as dense as they used to be, so they're more susceptible to collapse upon themselves, though in many cases with compression fractures, there isn't even necessarily a fall that predisposed to that fracture. The final cause that can lead to compression fractures is malignancy or cancer. And usually cancers that lead to this have metastasized or spread there from other sites, commonly from prostate cancer or breast cancer. So what do patients with compression fractures feel? Well, they often report that they have pain over the fracture site. And that pain can radiate into their buttocks or their leg, in particular depending on what level has collapsed. And these can happen at any level throughout the spine. It's often associated with kyphosis. What kyphosis means is a, a pitching forward of the spine. So you'll frequently see patients who've had compression fractures will have more of a hunch to the way that they stand up from that collapse. And that's what's caused that kyphosis or leaning forward. And again, sometimes they can cause pain down the legs, what we call radicular symptoms. So on examination, when we see patients with compression fractures, they'll usually have tenderness over the fracture site. Sometimes they'll have what's called a positive straight leg raising test, which is a test that we look at in pain that goes down the legs. They'll report that pretty much any activity makes it worse. Uh, walking, standing, lifting, um, trying to be active really in, in any way. Um, we often diagnose these based upon an x-ray because that will show you the compression fracture pretty clearly. And when you have a patient who didn't have a fracture or a collapse before that then has a new collapse on an x-ray, especially with pain over that area, that strongly suggests that that fracture is what's causing the pain. 
Sometimes, however, we see a fracture on an x-ray and we don't know if it's new or old or if it's actually the cause of the pain. And in those cases, an MRI can help us tell the difference because the appearance on the MRI will let us know if that fracture has healed or if it is relatively new based upon the findings on the MRI scan. MRI is necessary when we want to know if a fracture is acute or chronic, in particular if we're planning on doing certain interventional treatments for it. It's indicated if patients have pain down their legs, numbness or weakness, and we want to evaluate um, that as well. So that's when we would get an MRI for a compression fracture. Um, what are some of the treatments for it? Well, the most common and the best first step when patients are able to do so is conservative care. That includes physical therapy with gradually increasing physical activity as tolerated, um, medications to treat the pain sometimes, and as well occasionally back braces to help stabilize that back while the fracture heals. Um, in some cases when those conservative measures don't work well enough or if someone is just so debilitated by pain they can't get out of bed, they can't function, etc. In those cases then we think about doing an intervention called a kyphoplasty which involves placing cement into the fractured bone in an effort to stabilize the fracture. And if you look here on your screen, you're gonna see a depiction of vertebral augmentation, which is another word for that fixing of the fracture. This is a patient who's had several compression fractures treated, um, and you see this dark material in the bones, and here you see this nice spread across the fracture line. That's cement going into that fracture to stabilize it. And oftentimes, a kyphoplasty or a procedure like this can lead to very rapid relief of some of those severe debilitating symptoms, which then allow patients to be able to do the physical therapy and increase their activity levels again. Um, it's really important that when you have a compression fracture from osteoporosis that you have to treat the osteoporosis. Um, if you've been told you have osteopenia or low bone density that isn't quite osteoporosis but you get a compression fracture, it's almost diagnostic for osteoporosis if you have a compression fracture and it's really important to treat the osteoporosis. That's where it's nice that a practice such as the Core Institute have specialists in bone health which can offer that treatment for our patients that do have osteoporosis and osteoporosis related fractures. Moving on in the bones section, we get to the joints and joints are intersections of bones. And there are two bone, two joints, um, excuse me, that really bear mention here that are the cause of an awful lot of low back pain. Facet joints is the first one I want to talk about, and again, a very common cause of low back pain. Facet joints are paired joints on either side of the spine. So here we see two of those vertebral bodies, and highlighted in purple there, you can see that this intersection here is where these two bones are meeting, and those are the facet joints. There's one on either side at every level going up and down the spine. And in patients with out significant arthritis or degeneration, these joints are bearing around three to 25% of the load of the spine. Um, in patients with significant arthritis, that number can go up to 70%. And um, arthritis in the back can either be an isolated problem, a primary problem, which most of us will develop a degree of arthritis in our lives, or sometimes it's related to other changes, such as degenerative changes, that slippage we saw earlier, and scoliosis, which means a curvature of the spine. Patients with scoliosis will quite often develop arthritis in their back because that curvature alters the way that those bones exhibit force on each other and it can, they can develop arthritis um, in particular around those areas of the, of the uh, scoliosis. So what are the symptoms? Sometimes, as we talked about before, it's difficult to distinguish right away um, because of overlapping pain symptoms. But the most common description is an achy pain, a dull pain that goes across the low back, worsens with prolonged sitting or standing. Often, if you sit for a long time and then you stand up, that, that significant achiness when you're trying to get moving um, first thing in the morning, et cetera, is very common. Um, most commonly, it's across the low back and may radiate to the buttocks. Um, it's not usually the primary cause of pain that gets down the legs, in particular past the knees. Um, on examination, we do facet loading maneuvers to try and see if that can make a patient's pain worse by putting pressure on those joints. That's usually extension or bending backwards and rotation. So if your pain doctor is twisting you around like this, it's us trying to assess those joints in your back to see if they may be a cause of your pain. People will often have tenderness to palpation when we push on those joints. And then the muscles that stabilize the spine on either side will frequently spasm and get really, really tight. And that's the body's way of trying to protect the spine and keeping it from moving. 
The diagnosis will be seen on x-ray, MRI, CT. We'll see facet changes. It doesn't always mean that this is the cause of the pain. That decision is made based upon clinical exam and actually one of the main treatments for arthritis pain helps to establish uh, the diagnosis. And that procedure is called a medial branch block. So medial branch blocks, you'll often see them called MBBs or blocks in the back, is a diagnostic procedure. And in this procedure, we place small needles next to the nerves that go to the joints in patients' backs. So basically, when you have arthritis in these joints in your back, your brain knows that they hurt because of these nerves taking those signals up to the brain and saying, hey, these joints are bothering me. So what we do for this procedure is we turn those nerves off with a small amount of local anesthetic or numbing medicine. Numbing medicine turns nerves off for a short amount of time. So this is why this procedure is a test. And if you ever have one of these, it's really important to remember that the relief will likely only be temporary. Anywhere from two to four hours is really the sweet spot for these, depending on the numbing medication that was used for your procedure. And that's why we really want to ask patients after this procedure if they were better during that really early time frame. After those few hours, as that numbing medicine wears off, those nerves turn back on and the pain frequently returns. We really expect this a clear benefit, 80% improvement in pain and function is what a lot of the insurance companies ask for to verify that response. And patients know when this works. Um, it's usually very clear to you if you've had this block, if it helped with your usual low back pain. So in the event that patients have this test injection and get that short-term relief, we repeat the block on a different date. That confirms that the response to the first block wasn't a placebo, and that helps us really establish the diagnosis is correct in terms of those nerves carrying the patient's pain. If you get good results from both test injections or medial branch blocks, you're then a candidate for what's called radiofrequency ablation. Radiofrequency ablation is often called burning the nerves, um, is something you'll hear very commonly. And basically what it involves is using small needles, again, similar to the test injections, but this time we actually do a little bit of extra testing once we place those needles next to where these nerves live. And on your screen, you'll see an x-ray picture of a radiofrequency ablation procedure on the right side. And you'll see a needle coming right up here and right up here and right up here. And then there's one right here. This is where the nerves are that go to these facet joints right here in the back. Once these needles are placed and we do some testing to make sure we're in the right spot and we numb up the area really well, these special needles heat up at the tip and we use that heat to disrupt or destroy those nerves and take them out of commission to relieve the pain signals um, that the patients are experiencing. And people who respond well to radiofrequency ablation can get anywhere from six months to two years of improvement. And as long as you get six months of improvement, um, you're eligible to repeat this procedure if your pain should come back. So I, I have no shortage of patients in my practice that I see about every year or so when those nerves start to regenerate and the back pain starts to come back for another ablation to try and keep them living their lives and doing the things that they want to do. The next joint we're going to talk about are the sacroiliac joints. So the sacroiliac joints are a very common pain generator that's often found, again, in conjunction with other things going on in the back. This is a, a picture of some bones. This is your sacrum right here, and this is your pelvis on either side. The hips, which aren't on this model, would go in right here and come off, here and come off. And then the sacroiliac joint is this connection here between the sacrum and the pelvis. Pain in these joints can be on one side or on both sides. And patients generally report pain overlying the upper buttock and the buttock area, and it sometimes will radiate down the side and the back of the leg, usually stopping at about the knee. This is a frequent area of pain where people will say that their hip hurts and they point back here, and there's many cases where what patients believe is coming from their hip is actually coming from these joints. Um, patients who are at higher risk for having sacroiliac pain are those who've had fusion surgeries in their back because that again alters the way that some of the bones move relative to each other. So that's a common um, cause and sometimes other injuries where you alter the way that you walk and carry yourself can irritate these joints and cause inflammation. 
We diagnose this uh, using examination and history. On exam, you'll usually see tenderness overlying that joint. Um, one of the frequent tests that we do for this is depicted here on your screen that's called Patrick's test, and it involves putting pressure on the hip and the knee to stretch that joint out. Gainsless test is another test. There are a variety of different provocative tests that your pain specialist may do to try and determine if this is the cause of your pain. Um, imaging is very rarely helpful or specific for diagnosis of sacroiliac pain. Kind of like the arthritis and the facet joints, this diagnosis is really established clinically based upon history examination and in this case by an injection where we place a small needle into the joint and put numbing medicine and steroid into the joint. That's what you see here on the right of your screen. This is the sacroiliac joint here. The needle is kind of hard to see, but it goes in right here, and this dark black line that goes up and follows that joint is contrast in the joint. And so what that shows us is that we're in the joint, and then we inject numbing medicine and steroid in there. Um, numbing medicine will give relief, sometimes temporarily, and then the steroid will give more long-term relief. And this is a procedure that can be repeated if significant improvement is noted. If improvement is noted but it doesn't last long enough, sometimes we'll use radiofrequency lesioning targeting different nerves than we did for the facet joints for the sacroiliac joint. And there are some newer minimally invasive fusion surgeries that are being done for this problem as well. Next we'll talk about discs. So discs are the shock absorbers in your back and you see a depiction of a disc there on your screen. So each bone or the vertebral bodies has a disc in between it and it's kind of like the shock absorber for those. And the center of it, the nucleus pulposus, is largely water. And we'll see what, why that means something on the next slide when we look at an MRI. And it's surrounded by layers of tissue called the annulus. And I kind of liken them to the radials on a tire that keep everything in place. So what can happen as discs degenerate is that they can herniate or extrude into the spine and cause problems. What we see here on the right is an MRI scan. And on this type of MRI scan, things that are bright have a lot of water in them, a lot of fluid. So this is the cerebrospinal fluid in the spinal canal. And what we're looking at here is a disc. And here's a bone and another disc. And if you look at these discs, you'll see that they have some brightness to them. Um, they're a brighter color than the bones. You can see the distance between the two bones, so there's some cushioning left there. As we go down to this level, you'll see that this disc here is much grayer. It's darker, which means there's less fluid. This disc has degenerated. And when we look at the back here, you'll see a bulge or a herniation of that disc. So some of that gel material has, in essence, squirted out into the spinal canal. And what happens a lot of the time with these is that that disc material will then push on nerves that go down the legs and cause radiating pain down the legs or what we call radicular pain or frequently sciatica. Herniated discs uh, most commonly happen in the lower lumbar levels of the back and it more often occurs in the morning, though certainly not always. Um, patients often have sharp pain that is very often associated with pain that goes down the legs, often past the knee, but it can be really anywhere in the leg depending on the nerve that's getting pushed on by these discs. Um, classically, it'll get worse with coughing, sneezing, prolonged sitting. Valsalva means when you kind of strain against a, a closed glottis, so if like weightlifters are really straining and grunting, sometimes that's a valsalva, and that can increase the pressure in the discs and increase pain from a herniated disc and sometimes lead to herniations themselves. How do we diagnose this? MRI is really going to tell us um, if there's a disc herniation because that's how we can see the discs. X-ray show us bones, not the discs, and the MRI will help establish the diagnosis. Um, treatment for this, um, non-surgical, often involves an epidural steroid injection, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a couple minutes. Um, and occasionally surgery is necessary to take that disc out and relieve the pressure on the nerves. Along the lines of discs, we move into spaces, and spinal stenosis is a term that you probably see a lot if you're above a certain age, if you look at an MRI or have friends. And what stenosis means is narrowing. And stenosis can refer to the foramen, which is on the sides of the bones where the nerves come out to go down the leg, or in the central canal, which is where all of the nerves and, and the spinal cord go. And that's really the one we're talking about today called central spinal stenosis. Usually this happens from a variety of factors. As we get older and we have arthritis and the joints get bigger, um, our discs tend to degenerate and bulge out. Some of the ligaments in our back tend to get a little bit thicker. All of these things can combine to narrow the spinal canal. 
And what I'm talking about with the spinal canal here is a, a model of a spine, and you'll see this is the spinal canal or the central canal. This yellow here represents the, the spinal fluid and the nerve, and you can see some nerves coming out. So if what you see there represents this, and spinal stenosis, sometimes it can be really narrowed down, and that narrowing can irritate those nerves on the way down to your legs. So the symptoms that patients find when they have spinal stenosis, they're often diffuse, and they can include both pain in the back and pain in the legs. Neurogenic claudication is a big word to refer to one of the more common things that we see when you have spinal stenosis related pain. And that's characterized as uh, aching and cramping in pain in the legs with activity. So what we see a lot is that people when they're sitting are okay, but once they start standing or walking for any length of time, their pain will get worse and worse and the legs will hurt more and more until they find a place to sit. Um, sitting usually relieves at least some of those symptoms fairly quickly. Um, classically, people feel better when they're hunched forward. So you'll see people who hunch over shopping carts while they're walking around the supermarket, or you may even find yourself doing this. That can sometimes be a sign of some narrowing in the back. And usually standing up straight can worsen things, and we see that when people are walking downhill. Now, there is a cause of pain in the legs with standing and walking that doesn't come from the spine. That's called vascular claudication, and that can come from the blood vessels in your legs. And it's important to rule that out as a cause in patients who may be at risk for that cause of pain in their legs. So how do we diagnose spinal stenosis? Again, like with our, uh, with our um, radiating pain or herniated discs, an MRI will usually verify the diagnosis. We can see the canal and see if it's narrowed. Treatment can be conservative at first, again, physical therapy, um, trying to get people moving, etc. But many patients will progress to needing some interventional treatment or some injections, such as epidural steroid injections, which can relieve some of these symptoms. And in patients who have severe pain that has not responded to the more conservative things like injections, surgery can oftentimes cure the cause of the narrowing. So epidural steroid injections, as we've talked about, are frequently used for that spinal stenosis pain that goes down the legs, or from herniated disc pain causing pain down the leg from pinching on a nerve. There are three different kinds of epidural steroid injections, and I'm gonna talk about each of them because I want you to understand that sometimes you may have not responded well to one type of epidural steroid injection, whereas a different approach may actually provide some benefit depending on your unique circumstances. So there are some patients where one approach to epidurals don't really work very well, but the other one may. So your pain specialist will be thinking about these options as we're planning your treatment in terms of trying to get you back to life with these injections. The choice, again, comes down to this clinician's judgment on what we think based upon um, all of the factors in your history and your imaging. Caudal epidural steroid injection is one of the earliest approaches to epidural steroid injections that was described and can be quite effective um, for many patients. It involves placing a needle much lower in the spine, actually below the lowest disc, down here at the sacral hiatus at the bottom of the sacrum. On this view here from the side, you see a dark line going up. That's the contrast and the medicine spreading upwards. And here we see this dark spread of medicine highlighting the nerves as this medicine is making its way up to the lower lumbar levels. This approach is often really uh, helpful and advantageous in patients who've had a lot of low back surgery, have a lot of hardware and scar tissue in the area because this avoids going through that scar tissue in terms of uh, giving the medication. And it also works really well for some of those lower levels. Some practitioners will put a catheter in through that space and thread it up to get to higher levels as well to um, treat some of the higher levels with this approach. Interlaminar epidural steroid injections is another approach. It's more specific than caudal because we actually select a level and can be on one side or the other of midline. And it involves coming again from the midline. So what you see here is a needle right in the middle um, between the two spinous processes placed in the epidural space. This is the approach that we use when we're doing labor epidurals for pregnant patients. However, those two are very different experiences. Using this approach for low back pain involves a much smaller needle, x-ray guidance, and, and a lot of other things that make it very different. And it doesn't involve putting a lot of numbing medicine to make patients numb. The intent is to put steroid medication in to try and treat the inflammation. Um, the, the next approach, which 
is probably the most common approach that we start with depending on an individual patient's scenario is the transforaminal. And what a transforaminal involves is placing small needles in those openings in the side where the nerves come out to go down the legs. So this is a very targeted approach where we have decided on these levels based upon your MRI findings, where the pain goes in your legs, and we target those levels as best we can um, with these needles. So here's a view from the front. This is a needle going in the side, and you can kind of see some contrast spread in here. This is a needle below. This patient has a disc herniation at this level, so we went above and below to really get good spread of medication in that area. This is a side view showing the needle going into that opening, and the nerve that goes down the leg would be found right here in that image. So that's where the nerve comes out to go down the leg. All right, the final of our broad um, topics in terms of causes of back pain are the muscles. Uh, muscles can cause a lot of pain and it can be quite severe. I've had patients come in and say, well, it's too severe to be a muscle pain. And that's not always the case. Muscle pain can be quite severe and quite debilitating. As we said, we see a lot of spasm in the muscles that stabilize the back in patients with degenerative conditions in their spine. And sometimes they'll have local areas of spasm called trigger points. And in those cases, uh, physical therapy and sometimes injections into those small areas of spasm in the muscle of numbing medicine plus or minus some steroid can bring some relief. One muscle that bears uh, specific mention is the piriformis muscle. The piriformis muscle is in your buttock, and what it does is it takes your hip out and externally rotates it. You can see it here in dark red on this picture. Uh, why do we care about the piriformis? Well, it's a, a not uncommon cause of back pain, and in about 15% of the population, your sciatic nerve actually goes through this muscle. So if this muscle spasms, it can actually compress the sciatic nerve and cause pain going down the leg almost identical to that of a herniated disc. However, the problem is not at the level of the disc, the problem is in this muscle. We often see symptoms of buttock pain, and again, with radicular or radiating symptoms down the leg with this condition, and sometimes it may worsen with defecation. How do we diagnose this? You really want to exclude other causes of back pain through a comprehensive evaluation and imaging as needed. Uh, piriformis stretch will sometimes reproduce symptoms. And again, that imaging is helpful sometimes in excluding the other causes as opposed to establishing the piriformis as the cause. Conservative care, physical therapy can be quite helpful for this complaint. Sometimes we do an injection under either x-ray or ultrasound guidance into those muscles to try and relax that spasm and relieve the pain. Um, and rarely, um, surgery can be done for these conditions. So what I hope you've got from tonight's talk is that there are multiple structures in your back that can cause pain. And they often cause overlapping patterns of pain. Sometimes this leads to some difficulty and challenges in determining what the actual cause of a patient's pain is. And in many patients, there's more than one cause. I liken sometimes chronic back pain to an onion where sometimes you peel away that first layer of the onion and there's another layer under there, another cause that we need to address using different, different techniques and addressing those different structures. Interventional options, as we've discussed tonight, um, exist that are low risk, done in the office, and can often bring patients a lot of relief and allow them to return back to their normal lives and work earlier and ideally avoid surgery. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was helpful and uh, I believe we'll take some questions. Uh, you know, when you're playing golf, obviously, you want to have some flexibility in doing your golf swing. Some of the back braces that we often use have rigid panels, which can restrict the motion of your back, and that's one of the ways in which they relieve pain. Um, the biggest thing I would say with braces is I would caution against using braces very frequently and for long periods of time unless directed to do so by your physician, because what happens sometimes is they can act as a crutch, if you will, and then that, those core muscles that we've been talking about and stressing the importance of can get weaker. Um, so sometimes when it comes to a back brace for golf, it's a little bit of trial and error and making sure that you're not depending on it all the time so that you can keep those core muscles engaged. Anything that engages the core is really important. Um, I frequently recommend people look at yoga. There's a lot of home yoga that you can do at home, sometimes Pilates and things that engage and strengthen the core muscles. There's actually some good data that shows that many yoga exercises and yoga can be as effective as some types of physical therapy. What I really just stress is keeping your core engaged, keeping it strong because most of us unfortunately aren't keeping it strong during the day when we're sitting in front of our screens.
I would say that there's, there's help available and the back pain takes you out of your life and I would consider at least investing the time in an evaluation to make sure that we can assess and make sure nothing more serious is going on and give you a variety of different treatment options. You may be surprised that you don't always have to invest a ton of time off of work to try and get better. So I would encourage you to, you know, get an evaluation if it's been going on for that long and just you're suffering all the time with it. So the, big, the best way I could summarize it is that when you smoke, you affect the oxygen delivery to your tissues. And so when you don't have good oxygen delivery to your tissues, your degenerative processes tend to be advanced as your ability to heal yourself and heal your tissues gets worse. So that's one of the, the main postulated reasons behind it. Um, there's myriad other reasons, but it really just has to do with the health of your body, supply of oxygen, supply of nutrients to your, to your structures and your back and your body. Uh, yes, tailbone pain. I, I didn't address that in this talk. Um, I was more focused on, on the lumbar spine, but tailbone pain or coccydnia is not an uncommon thing that I see in my practice. Um, sometimes it can be caused by trauma. Um, sometimes that trauma is not relatively recent, you know, a significant fall. I've seen a number of patients who've fallen off horses, for instance, and landed on their tailbone or slipped on ice in some of our northern states and landed on their tailbone, et cetera. Um, treatment for tailbone pain, there is actually an injection that we can do into the um, sacrococcygeal joint, and uh, there's a ganglion of nerves that live there in the tailbone. Um, that can bring a lot of relief for people suffering from tailbone pain. Um, if you're referring to uh, kyphoplasty, the cement is there and it, and it lasts. Um, patients who have a kyphoplasty procedure to fix a uh, compression fracture in their back are statistically more likely to have another fracture and likely require another one. Now there's some controversy over the exact rationale behind that. Some would suggest that those who are at risk for compression fractures in the first place are at risk for having further fractures. But in terms of into the same vertebral body again, that would be pretty rare. I think spinal cord stimulation is an excellent treatment modality for the right patient. Um, in patients who are well selected for that treatment option, you can do really well and have a lot of really good relief. What do I mean by carefully selected? Um, without speaking about any individual uh, patient's case, um, patients who've had, for instance, back surgeries and have persistent pain in the back and the legs, for which there is no further surgery indicated after evaluation by a surgeon, patients in that circumstance may respond really well to spinal cord stimulation. And there's an evolving uh, list of indications now where that type of treatment is being used for other painful conditions as well. I think the important thing to stress with that type of treatment is to make sure that there isn't something that could be surgically corrected, or if there is, that that surgery is something that the patient is sure they don't wanna proceed with, or may not be able to because of a variety of other reasons such as their personal risks. I think it can help with the, the muscle aspect of our discussion tonight in terms of really stretching out and trying to loosen up some of those tight areas of the muscles. So a lot of patients as a part of a comprehensive treatment plan will get a lot of relief with massage. I wish we could get all the insurance carriers to cover it. Um, unfortunately that uh, we don't always have a lot of luck with. A lot of patients will report that. Um, a lot of patients in some of those occupations where you're walking around on hard surfaces, bending and twisting throughout the day, um, and just that stress of walking, et cetera. Good footwear and good cushioning in your footwear can sometimes uh, help with that aspect of it. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap between hip and back pain, and that's where getting a good evaluation is really important. There are a lot of people who see my colleagues on the hip services who do hip surgeries that think their hip is the problem and end up seeing me shortly thereafter, and there are those that see me thinking their back is the problem and end up seeing one of my hip colleagues. So there is some overlap in, in the pain patterns from those two um, structures.
yes, it, it absolutely can. Um, on the natural side, there are a lot of people that talk about anti-inflammatory herbs, etc. cetera. Um, if you look at the data really closely in terms of controlled studies, I'm hard pressed to make an absolute recommendation for any of them in particular, though there are many where there's suggestion in the data that some of the anti-inflammatory foods may help and they're not likely to hurt as long as you're not taking excessive amounts of anything. A lot of what we've talked about translates very well to the cervical spine, especially things like epidural injections, the discs pushing on nerves, and the difference in the neck is if you have a disc that pushes on a nerve, that pain's gonna go to your arm instead of your leg. But it's a very similar process, and as well with radiofrequency ablation for arthritis pain, we very commonly do that in the neck as well as the low back. We can treat them at the same time. We can't do injections in those areas at the same time, however. We really, when we're doing an intervention or an injection, we will focus on one area at any particular session so that we can really gauge the response to it. But we do frequently, I have no shortage of patients with neck and low back pain that we treat um, at the same time and we really just decide in the order of what we're gonna do things um, based upon which is bothering them the most. Um, standing with good posture, standing upright is, is what's, um, what's going to really do you the most good. Um, just standing in general will. Um, you know, if you're at work at a computer, if you have access to a sit-stand desk, I'd recommend considering it, especially if you have back pain. I mean, I can tell you I have one at home. I practice what I preach um, because when I had to sit for a long time in the early days of the pandemic doing only telehealth visits, I was sitting in front of a computer obviously for hours and hours a day, and I found that that increased my back pain until I was able to change positions throughout the day. So I think that's the best way I would put that.